How many of y'all tonight are glad you're in the house of God? <laughs> Let's get our Bibles tonight. I want you to turn to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 46. Good as yours. 
It may be, thank God, probably a little bit better than if I don't know. But the reality is, I know what we have here. I know what we possess here. I know what we believe here. And I don't know about you, but I'm one of them people that still believe God can. You didn't hear me. I said, I believe God can. I, I, I'm one of them people that believe that the book of Acts, the Bible says that Jesus began to do these works, and I still think he's doing those works. I think exactly what went on in the book of Acts in the four Gospels has continued right on till today. And most of our churches in the land say that, you know, the Holy Ghost went out with the last apostle that died. I got news for them. I don't know who the last apostle they're talking about is. I guess they're concerning John. But John never died. His gospel is everlasting. Uh, don't make me get into that. And uh, there's apostles today. So the last apostle hasn't died yet. In fact, the book of Ephesians said that God gave prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, and apostles until we're all edified and in the faith, until we are in the full statue of the man Christ Jesus. So I am a firm believer that until we all come to the unity of the faith, that all that fivefold ministry is still existing today. Amen. I want to be a part of that church, don't you? Amen. I'm going to read something that uh, I've read before. I, I, I preached on this several years ago. And I want to deal with this scripture. Uh, I'm not going to preach on it tonight, but I want to deal with it. One verse from Ezekiel chapter 46, and you all do not have to stand tonight. But how many of you trust me that what I'm reading is Bible? Amen. Okay. Verse number 9. Listen to this. But when the people of the land shall come before the Lord in the solemn feast, he that entereth in by the way of the north gate to worship shall go out by the way of the south gate. And he that entereth by the way of the south gate shall go forth the way of the north gate. He shall not return by the way of the gate whereby he came in, but shall go forth over against it. Here's what God's saying through the prophet Ezekiel. When you come to the house of the Lord, if you come in the north gate, you're going to leave the south gate. And if you come in the south gate, you're going to leave the north gate. Now listen, I have searched the scripture over. And I find no biblical reason why God so commanded this verse to be carried out this way. But I do know this, that all scripture according to the Bible is inspired by the Holy Ghost. So there must be a reason why God put that in the scripture. And I think it is a type or a symbolic. I think what God's trying to get us to understand as the children of God is when we come to church, notice this, that there is no law in that scripture what gates you come in. If you come in the north gate, that's up to you. If you come in the south gate, it is up to you. So there's no law telling you what gate you come in, but there is some recommendations and requirements for what gates you leave. Can I just say to you tonight what God's trying to get us to understand that? It doesn't really matter how we come to church. But it does matter how we leave church. So in other words, the Lord ain't concerned with how we look when we come to church. We ought to look different when we leave church. He's not really concerned with what, we, uh, what attitude we come to church with. But when we leave church, we ought to come with the opposite attitude.
my head right now. There is no inability of the power of God. Do you understand that? If I come as beat down as I can be and as depressed as I can be and as eat up with sin as I can be, God's arm is a too sore that it can't reach down to save it. Either is his ear too heavy that he cannot hear. And let me just say this. When I come into his house, there is enough stuff going on in this house with power and anointing and freshness of the Spirit that whatever problem I come in with, it don't matter to God. He is sufficient to help that problem. I can leave happy. I can leave blessed. I can leave sinless if I came in sinful. There's no law telling Israel how to come in the gate or even what gate they can enter into. If you come in the south gate, come in that gate if you want to, but you got to leave the north gate. The command is on what gate to leave. What a boring service. Listen to this. If we come to church and leave the same way. Right. 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 I was talking with somebody this week that said, they started naming names that go to our church. And I'm on the phone. And they're calling me about church issues and things they think need to be changed in the church and thank God for them, praise God, and everybody wants to change everything. <laughs> they don't want to help change it, they just want to tell me how to. And uh, so I'm on the phone and they start naming names of people and said they come and they've got a long face and they sit there with folded arms and they're, and, and they're not putting anything into the service. And how do we get those people to do that? Here was my answer. We don't. Because nobody controls me except my attitude. Can I share with you? If you want to come in beat down and leave that way, God will let you. If you want to come in and you want to be depressed and discouraged and you want to act like, I don't want to put nothing in the service because of some type of pity party you're on, God will allow you and everybody else will shout on your pocketbook. But if you get the attitude that I'm
Well, they are different. How can we expect anybody to come in our church that's a visitor and feel anything if we're just determined to sit down on God? Right. You know what the law of Genesis is? It's the first law of Genesis. Here it is. Everything reproduces after its own kind. Yes. If you hang out with depressed people, before long, when they tell you how bad of a victim they are, you'll start believing you're a victim too. When they keep pulling out how miserable their life is, if you hang out with them, you will be depressed too. It's kind of like the guy that goes to a psychiatrist and he's talking, he, he, he's suicidal, so he goes to the psychiatrist and they're up on the 10th floor of the building and he said, man, I've got problems. And the psychiatrist says, lay that on my couch and tell me all about it. Three hours later, him and the psychiatrist both jump out the window. <laughs> Sometimes, church is like that. We come to church and we're just Man, we're in the best place we could ever be. Do you realize whose house you're sitting in tonight? Do you realize that this house is different than the one you live in? We're in the house of God. He abides in this house. His anointing is here. His power is here. No matter what I need from God, I can get it at the church. Why? Because this word promises me that I will meet you at the mercy seat. He said, if you'll come to the there's nothing bigger than what I can handle. I'm changing if you get to church. Preacher, you're putting an awful lot of emphasis on the church. Let me tell you what Jacob said about it. Jacob put his head on the stone, and the angels descended and ascended onto a ladder. And Jacob awoke woke and said, Hey, God was in this place, and I knew it not, so I'll call it Bethel, the house of God. And then he says this. The gateway to heaven. Jesus is the door to get to heaven, but the church is the gate. I wish I had some help in here. So when I enter his courts, why do you think David is telling me when I enter his courts, I ought to come in with some praise on my lips. I ought to come in with a, faith, a heart of thanksgiving. I ought to enter this place looking for something to excite, to ha exciting to happen. Let me tell you the best you can do that'll beat the devil every time. If you've had a terrible week and it comes Wednesday night or Sunday mornings rolling around, you just remind the devil, you beat me all you want to, but Sunday's coming and I'm going to enter the house of God and in that house there's going to be a presence there that's going to destroy every yoke of bondage. In the last time I read, the real anointing of God destroys yokes. Right? Let me, let me slow down and teach for a minute. It'd be awful boring if we came to church and left the same way we came. Every encounter with God or His house should cause us to be changed when we leave. Listen to this. You want to talk about a man depressed? The prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, the king has died. And he's close to Isaiah the prophet. They're, they're friends. He loves him. But he dies. And Isaiah has went to his funeral. And on the way back, he happens to be depressed and discouraged. And before this, listen to this. Isaiah chapter 1 through chapter 5. Everything Isaiah said about the Lord, he said, woe is me. Woe, woe, judgments are coming. Woe to the land. Woe to the inhabitants of the land. Whoa, he, he's preaching judgment for the first five chapters. He goes to the house of God, leaving that funeral, just happens to walk up by the temple of the Lord. And the Bible said, when I entered the temple, when he entered the temple, he said the smoke of his glory filled the house of the temple insomuch that it shook the pillars that the temple stood on. And he said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and the train of his glory filled the house of God. Now listen, he came in depressed and discouraged and grief hardened because of the death of the king. But when he saw the Lord high and lifted up, God understood in order for Isaiah to leave the temple mount different than what he come, I've got to show up in my glory to show him that everything he's been through 
true ain't as bad as what he's trying to hold on to. I had an old man tell me one time in my early years of ministry when I first started preaching, he said, listen, don't ever let the devil tell you that things are as bad as they say. They're never as bad as they say. That first picture that the devil throws at you when you go through church issues and church problems, don't let the devil tell you that it's bad and it's going to take you down. Tell the devil you got a great big God. See, we're so wrapped up on how big the devil is in our life and how much he's beat us. That's why we don't have a lot of testifying around here in testimony services because people don't understand that it is a testimony service telling how good God is, not how big the devil is. Come on, somebody. And if we come to church, if we stop praising the devil, do you know that in your mouth lies a tongue that is full of life and death? And whatever you say out of your mouth produces either life in you or it produces death in you and when you come in here your testimony your song your praise ought to be how great God is not how big the devil is right. come on. so he comes to the house he sees God high uh, or the Lord high and lifted up and all of a sudden he turns and notices the altar now listen to me and, and I'm not going to be here 10 more minutes in 5 minutes he turns and looks at the altar. And on the altar, there are coals of fire burning. Nowhere in that Isaiah's gospel does he notice these coals before. Before he makes up his mind, I come to church one way. I need to leave another. I need to see God. He looks at the altar. Listen, if we could get our sight off of all the bad stuff that's going on in our life and all the little things that happens to us every day. Stop acting like that you're the only one the devil fights. It rains on the just and the unjust. Everybody has bad days. Everybody has off times. Everybody has times of depression. Everybody goes through times of hurt. But if, we're, if we would turn our vision and stop seeing all the bad stuff and get our eyes on the fire He walks up. Isaiah does. And he looks at the coals that's burning on the altar. And all of a sudden, an angel from heaven shows up with a tongue in his hand and picks up one of them hot coals of fire. And Isaiah says, what are you going to do with that? And God says, who will go for me? And whom shall I see? When he heard that call, listen, I think that what is missing in our church and the reason that we come in here and lead the same way, we have forgot, number one, who God is. We need to see Him again high and lifted up. Number two, we have forgot there is still fire on these altars that we that can burn out anything out of our life that shouldn't be there. And number three, can I just share with you that there is a call of God on our life that I do not have time as a preacher to get hung up in the woes of the world My pastor used to tell me when I went out to preach, when he laid hands on me and ordained me to go out to preach, this is what he said to me. Here was his instruction. I don't care where you go and what you face in ministry, you don't have a problem. I left that church and went to pastor my first church and ran into problems. I pastored my second church and I ran into problems. I've pastored here now for 27 years and I have ran into some problems. But every time I went back to my pastor to tell him the problem, he said, you don't have a problem. Yep. I've had times where deacons was mad at me. I've had church splits. I've had stuff that went on in the church. And I thought, my God, this is the end of it. We're going to shut the door. The ministry is going down. I'd go back to him. He'd say, you don't have a problem. One day I asked him, what do you mean I don't have a problem? He said, you have a calling. He said, I'll tell you who's got the problem. Is the one that if the devil can stop your calling, it'll be the next one you were going to reach with this calling that's about to drop off into hell. The only people who got the problem is those that's fixing to go to hell. Now stop bellyaching about some little thing that's happened temporary in your life and get a calling again. Am I making sense to anybody? How much greater would our church be if we 
walk in here and we just center our heart on God, refresh us with the fire that's off the altar. Let us see God high and lifted up again. Let us see Him as He's able to handle any issues we have. And then, Lord, give us a calling. Who will go for me? Here's what the Bible said. Isaiah confessed. And he said, Lord, I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell among the people of unclean lips. I can't go. When he said that, the angel turned. With that tone filled with the fire, the coal of fire from the altar, flew over to where Isaiah was and touched that coal to his lips. And it burnt him. It burnt his uncleanliness right out of his mouth. Let me, let, me, let me give you the uncleanness of Isaiah. He wasn't cursing. He wasn't using God's name in vain. He wasn't living a lifestyle of sin. He was a prophet. His message had become distorted by him preaching, Woe, 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 everything's bad around me. We need to watch what we say. Because what happens is all you're doing is drawing the devil's attention on all the bad stuff that's happening. And if that's got your face shaking and if that's making you stumble, how much more do you think the devil's going to throw your way? If he knows it's working. He touched his mouth with the coals off that altar and Isaiah said, now Lord I'll go. Now send me. His whole message changed. Let me, let me, listen to me. When Isaiah left the hill of the Lord, when he left the house of God, you know what Isaiah prophesied? Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. His name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. His whole message went from whoa, 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 look at the nation, look at the people, look at me, everything's bad, until his message becomes there is a Savior coming. He never again prophesied woe. His message was completely about the vision. Let me give you a, a, a prophecy of Isaiah. But get this. Isaiah 53. Anybody know what it is? He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we were healed. Do you understand? He prophesied all of the life of Jesus right in the book of Isaiah. But he doesn't Overwinding about the condition he's in. Now I'm going to tell you when, when God has built this church. is when we come in here excited about being here. I wish I could just say what I want to say. Come on, come on. If it ain't me saying, I'm going to just sit here and fold my arms. If it ain't me preaching, I'm going to be mad. If I don't like the person doing it, I ain't getting into the service. You need to get saved. <laughs> I'm telling you, no matter what preacher in this house preaches, it's the Word of God. That's what you ought to be amen in, not the preacher. It don't matter who's up there singing the song. If they're singing about Jesus and lifting him up, that's the what we're doing. It ain't about you. It ain't about me. This ain't our house. This is the house of the Lord. And listen. I promise you, you come to my house, you ain't gonna have a joy. You have, I, I'm gonna have it my way. You in my house. We gonna watch my TV show. It, it'll be Bonanza. We're watching it. Gunsmoke. That's what I want to watch. You ain't watching no nasty stuff on my TV. It's going to be my way. You understand what I'm saying? When you come to my house, we're going to listen to the music I want to listen to. Come on. I'm going to set the seat I want to sit in. Come on. So what makes us think we can go to God's house and have it our way? This ain't Burger King, baby. We come in here and all of us have done it. We come in here and 30 minutes before service, we either come and talk about all the bad stuff that's happened to us all week.
week and then expect to in a moment of somebody hit the piano scream, okay, now let's step into praising God. Or we rush in here five minutes late and expect to drop right into worship. Why can't you know in the Old Testament they came, and even in the New, they came to the house of God in reverence and never opened their mouth for hours. They would sit and just worship God quietly. Be still and know that. I've sat on that stage and watched people right in the congregation look over and ask somebody, where are you going to eat at? And people are shouting, praising God, and the service is going up. Where are you going to do that? How's your week been? How can we do that? How can we talk when the awesomeness of God is in the building? When somebody's being blessed, how can we talk about any other thing but God? Am I getting through to anybody today? Yeah. Not two minutes. If you come and you leave, I've heard all the excuses. Well, it's so-and-so's fault. It's their fault. I'm mad. I'm upset. No, it's nobody's fault but yours. Now, I'm going to tell you where this comes from. Y'all know where this message comes from? I come in here Sunday night. I speak to be tired. I, I was angry. I come in here. Things that happened Sunday. I was fit to be tired. I come in here. I set up on that stage. Brother Alvin looked over at me and said, You okay? Yeah, I'm going to come back. Liar. <laughs> Let me know his confession is good for the soul, they say. I got to the back door. I had 15 people walk by me. You okay? I'm fine. Somebody said, finally, you okay? I said, you ask me again, I'll show you. <laughs> when I'm upset, when I'm angry, I want to be left alone until I calm down. And I got up Monday morning, and I heard the Lord speak to me and say, how many people do you think in that congregation knew you were upset just last night. Mm -hmm. You're the leader of that church. You're on the stage. How many of you think knew you upset? You came in angry. Did you leave different? I left angry. I left unsettled in me. You understand that? Was it God's fault? No. It was mine. Why didn't I walk in the door angry at stuff that had happened that day and just bring it to Jesus and get on the fire of that altar and say, touch that code to me so I don't walk through this service upset with it. Am I making any sense to anybody? Sometimes, listen to me, I'm, I preach stuff that I don't live myself. And what I mean by that, before I preach it, I, I deal with, you know what, statistically, it is a fact. I preach pastors' conferences all over the world, and here's what pastors preach. They preach what they deal with themselves the most. I got 150 people on Sunday morning that I'm responsible for, and I'm here grabs and complaints from every area you can. I ought to be upset. But according to this, I can't be. I've got to, I've got to come into his course with praise. I gotta come into his gates with thanksgiving. I gotta be thankful. Whatever state I'm in, I've gotta be thankful. So it's not God's fault that you leave the same as you came. Let me share something with you. There is no scripture in the Bible in the New Testament, the four gospels, that you will find when Jesus visited the temple, he didn't change things. He either changed the atmosphere, he changed the people. Houses he went to, they would break off ceilings, lower people down into the presence of the Lord just because he was a changer. He changed people's lives. Everywhere he went, he changed people. So why, in this modern day we're living in, how can Jesus come into us, in, in, in our service, the Spirit of God start moving, which is the Lord, now, in a different form, is Jesus in spirit. He's with us. He sweeps through our church. And we sit here. And then we blame. We'll throw blame. Well, the preacher.
preacher was dry. The singer was dry. The church was dry. Something's wrong with the church. I'm the only one right. Everybody else is wrong. No, it's us. I don't have to look past the mirror. When I leave church with the wrong attitude, or I sit in church with the wrong attitude, I don't have to look past my own personal mirror to know who has the issue. I mean, there was times when Jesus came to his house and whipped him out of his house. And then there was other times he entered the house, uh, his house and healed him. There was other times, if you, if you read Solomon's temple, in Mark, or in Mark, I believe it is, that they were having service and angels was coming down and stirring waters. The pool of Bethesda being stirred by the angel of the Lord. Troubled waters were at his house. I wrote that down in my notes. Troubled waters were at the house of God. And it just hit me as soon as I wrote it. There ain't going to be some troubled waters in our churches at times. You ain't going to like everybody that goes here. But you've got to love them if you're going to heaven. And you better treat them right. I better treat them right. You better treat them right. There's going to be times in our church. Do you know why Jesus, even in the Old Testament, said Set them out by twos. If you're going to go preach, take somebody with you. Why do you think the wisest man that ever lived, Solomon, said, Set them out by twos? You know why? He said, So if one gets weak, the other can apply strength to hold him up. Now, let, let's, come here, come here Terry. Me and Terry is big time for but there is times in the last year, he'll tell you, because I've shared it with you, that I've been weak in spirit. Am I right? But he's helped me to stay. There's been times when he's been weak and I've helped him. Don't do that. Amen. Now, here's the issue. There is a guarantee if you live for God longer than five days. <coughs> That there's going to be some times when you don't feel like going on. You better figure out and get around some people that challenges you to live right. And to keep it up. And I'm not talking about friends that just pat you on the back and say, do whatever you want to do. You're okay with me because you're my friend. I'm talking about friends that will stand in front of you and say, straighten up in this area. Don't do that. Alva preached it real good Sunday night. A real friend loves us at all times. And a brother is born for adversity. A brother is born into your life for times that you'll go through adversity to help you through. There's, there's different things that happen in the house of God. But all of those things, whether he whipped them out of the church or healed them at the church or angels were at the church or troubled waters were at the church, out of all that stuff, people left every time Different than what they came. Amen. Every single time. I don't want to go to a church where I, it doesn't change my life. Amen. I don't want to hear a sermon that doesn't challenge me and change my life. I don't want to hear a song that doesn't make me want to stand up and exalt the Lord. I don't want to hear mamas teaching angels how to sing. I could care less. <laughs> I don't believe that anyway. But I do. I mean, it's an emotional song. We cried. We lost your mama. But that ain't gospel. I want to hear songs that uplift the name of Christ that makes me want to stand up and forget the day I've had and forget the week I've had and say, I want to leave this service tonight different than what I came in. Amen. The church is supposed to be powerful, anointed. Let me tell you something. I have been gotten on to several times by the elders of this church, our elder board, because of my transparency in the pulpit. <clears throat> but I grew up in churches that I thought those preachers are so close to God, I could never be saved. Only to find out they weren't as perfect as what they thought they were. 
And when I started my ministry, I thought, God, I want to be able to say to that congregation, I'm dealing with this in my own personal life. And I have found out over the years that the exact same devils is chasing me is the exact same devils is chasing you all. The church is supposed to be powerful and anointed. And if we aren't, those that will come to our services will never be changed. Right. Two things I've done. My neighbor that showed up, 79 years of age, Sunday, and he said, I've never had anybody to tell me I've got to do something with Jesus. I've got to make a decision. 79 years of age. And I got off the phone, and as soon as I thought, man, thank you, Lord, for giving me that message. I didn't know he was going to be here. That message spoke to him. If it didn't speak to anybody else in this house, it spoke to him. And instantly, I got upset. Why did that man come and sit in one of our services and not get saved? Why would he admit that that message pierced his heart and convicted him? Why wasn't we so enthused by the power of God? Why wasn't the Spirit so strong Sunday morning? Why, why wasn't all of us so far into the service that he couldn't help but to walk this aisle and get saved before he left? Right. And this may be too straight tonight, but I'm going to tell you. We're too concerned about our personal wants and needs, and we're a selfish generation. That right. the church is all about us. Well, it ain't. I'll tell you the most important person here the last Sunday morning was Mr. Rowan. That was unsaved. And we think we got something in the church to gripe about. You know what happened? Jesus was born. I'm, I'm done with this right. It's the same thing. So I'm yeah. Jesus was born in Shepherd's County when he was first born. <laughs> Two years later, wise men. He was two years old and the wives been kind of brought gold, frankincense, and murder. But on their way, they were told by the king, when you find him, how long have you been following the star? Two years. When you find him, come back the same way you went to him. Come back that way and let me know where he's at so I can go worship him. And the Bible said that he was deceived because he was trying to deceive them because he literally wanted to kill Jesus. So they traveled from the king's house to the place where Jesus is at. The Bible said when they found Jesus, he was a young boy in the house with Joseph and Mary. He's not in the cave. He ain't in the shelter. He's in the house. <laughs> They give him gold, frankincense, and murder. Life, death, resurrection. That's what those three, three things represent. They present it to him. And the Bible says this, and this is so key. It says, and they departed a different way than they came. Anytime you have an encounter, a true encounter with Jesus Christ, you will depart different than what you came from. On March the 30th, 1986, when I walked the aisle of that church, that man of God got up and preached to me such a powerful, powerful message. Nobody else in that church got saved that day. But me. But it was what was meant for me. And when I walked in into that altar and I had that account with the Lord, that personal account, when I got up off that altar, I went home. I went to my buddy's house. I got stuff that was hid out of my buddy's house. I poured the drugs down the commode. I poured the whiskey down the commode. Didn't touch it since. God's that powerful to do that. And wipe away every sin that I had ever committed. Come on. And justify me and sanctify me and fill me with the Holy Ghost and all the stuff he's done for me. Why isn't he able to handle all the little issues that stop us from coming in here and having church like we should have? I'll 
I'll tell you what. He can't heal what you won't reveal. And he can't pick up what you won't lay down. And there are some people that just wants to be miserable. And, and they want to make everybody around them miserable. So they hold on to it. It's Linus's blanket. It's the teddy bear the kid won't let go of. It's the baby doll the little girl holds on to until its arms are ripped off of it. We get in church and we throw tantrums and we hold on to things instead of repenting over it and saying it's me. It's nobody else, it's me. Well, I'm done. I would ask you if you love me, but I hope you hear me. And I hope we can come back Sunday. We just so feel up with the Lord when we come into his you know, you know the Bible says enter his. You don't say be here 30 minutes and then get it. Enter his courts with praise. And into his gates with thanksgiving. When we pull on the parking lot, we ought to be like, whoo, we're at the house of God. We will have church this morning. We can do that if we just have the right attitudes. Alright? Let's stand. <clears throat> what time is it? Somebody? Hey, I'll let y'all out early tonight. <laughs> I want you to go pray and come back praying. Hey, listen. Uh, Sunday, come in here fired up and ready to have church. All right? And I think we can. Okay? We got some visitors that's going to be here Sunday, so we need everybody to be on board. All right? Let's pray that if Mr. Roland comes back Sunday, he makes that decision to follow Christ. Amen. Amen.